This video is brought to you by the final handshake. Hope, despair, nightmares, determination, loss and more. Today we received the final trailer for Sword Annihilation War of Underworld Part 2. Well, most probably the final trailer. Well, Aniplex does have a stage on July 4th. They can't show more than they already have. I do not expect a new trailer there. But without further ado, welcome to Alicization Explained, and it's me, Gamer Turk, your best source of Sword Art Online information. First off, this is an explained video. I strongly recommend you watch the uncut trailer by clicking the icon on the top right and then coming back since I won't show the full unedited trailer here due to Sony Music Entertainment Japan's copyright abuse. Secondly, this is an explained video about a trailer which falls into mild spoiler territory. Naturally, breaking down a trailer extensively requires me to talk about spoiler contents, but I aim these videos to be extensive teasers of what to expect and don't really spoil entire events and their results. I mean, I will have references that I'm sure those who read the novels will instantly get, but if you haven't read what happens, you won't make much sense of it anyway. So, while I will not outright share explicit spoilers here, if you do not enjoy any kind of hints about future content, it is better for you to leave the video now or just use the timestamps I provided in a pinned comment and the description to carefully navigate around those spoilers that you do not want. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon as you can always come back after individual episodes for episode explained videos which remain spoiler free and only focus on the episode that aired that day. As always, links to Sword Art Online Light Novels are in the description and if you use the affiliate links I provided, you will support the channel at no additional cost. War of Underworld Episode 12 ended at around page 50 of Volume 17, Alicization Awakening, so if you want to continue before the anime does, that's the book you're going for. But okay, that's a lengthy introduction, without further ado, let's start with the trailer and as we have gotten accustomed to by now, this trailer also begins with a very short recap portion compared to the previous ones, with Alice's sentiment right before the war began when she asked Kirito one thing. If she were to fall, he should pick up his sword again. Unbeknownst to her, she is not one of the four people Kirito would listen to, but... <laughs> with that, we jump straight into the action. Most of these early scenes are basically the same fighting sequences we have seen in the earlier trailer, but from different timestamps in the episode, taking place in and around the ruins with large statues. I'm particularly happy about the Sleeping Knights Deban in these trailers. They are a vital part of this mid-war effort, more so than anybody around I would say, so I'm glad to see they are getting the screen time they deserve. Then we see the massive turning point in the war, while Sakuya is bravely fighting, we see Alicia roof falling down, which leads to one of the key events that turns the tides in the war. It's not a scene I expect to be conveyed well in the anime, if you ask me, it wasn't even conveyed well in the books due to a certain lack of emphasis on the past of some characters and their relationship, but still, I'll hope for the best. With Sakuya Slash, the setting changes over to the Wasteland Plateau with Barkuli and Gabriel Miller and right off the bat, we can see a massive upgrade in animation quality compared to the earlier trailer. Whether it was always intended to be polished to this standard with a different stroke style or it was decided to be polished after the delay announcement, but I'm thrilled about what I'm seeing here. It's supposed to be a very simple yet very brutal fight and I feel like the thicker strokes around the characters and their facial expressions gives it an immense amount of weight that it required. This is the ultimate Berkuli moment where we will get to see everything he has up in his sleeves and more. It still requires a lot of inner monologues as I said, it's a very simple looking fight from the outside as it's an incredibly tactical fight mostly happening in the minds of these characters. Sure, the art style certainly gives the weight it needs but let's keep praying the inner monologues are kept as well to give the battle its full depth. I really like how they snuck in Fanatio and Alice shots in there, in fact, I would not be surprised if the Fanatio one especially is real time. And I talked about Gabe's eyes in the previous trailer analysis so I won't go into it again here. These bits here are edited quite confusingly so let me clarify this. 
You should not expect Shet and Iskan to join this specific fight between Berkuli and Vecta. They are still completely to the north around the ravine created by Asuna slash Stacia. And quickly, we go further north after that to just outside of the Great Eastern Gate with Lil Pilin, the leader of the orcs. The anime had teased this when his folk was sacrificed for the worm spell. There was a huge red light around his face when he was crying. But the moment of truth is coming closer for him and we see him with a proper seal of the right eye in a clean manner. And in the background, uncharacteristically for the Dark Territory, you see a field of flowers. And that is part of the special account ability of Terraria, the Goddess of Earth. It's an ability that appears in dire circumstances and sadly, the Goddess put herself in a quite a terrible circumstance. As for Lilplin here, the only way for Dark Territory members to proc the seal of the right eye is to think about disobeying their stronger superiors and well, looking back at the scene from the previous trailer, it should paint a clear picture for you. Well, Leafa herself does not have much screen time and well, she probably pulled the shortest stick possible. I have to say, I'm looking forward to her scenes the most, as she is also the most badass one in her very limited screen time. She definitely will not disappoint with her scenes. Next up, we see more red lights approaching over the statues. I mean, it should be clear by now as to who the person is at this point for pretty much everyone. But in the previous trailer explained, there was a reason why I referred to him as a ghost of the past. It's because that was the word used by Klein when he could not believe what he was seeing. The one person that destroys the entire human guardian army with his gravitas and cunning nature. He's a foe that Kirito first heard about on floor 2 of Aincrad and this is the climax of a journey that started all those years ago. Asuna on the edge of execution here is not even a quarter of the real meat of the scene. We get two different shots of Subtilizer, of course he's talking about enjoying the soul that tastes like an aged drink. We see Asuna and Liz in absolute terror, these are gonna be really heart-wrenching moments when they arrive. Again, the trailer really focuses on Asuna's scenes, probably for marketability purposes, but she's borderline broken during these moments, barely able to move. There is however one person with enough fire inside to keep going to prevent further torture. And we get the Higa scene, which is quite important, talking about if only there was one more person with strong enough of an image for Kirito. Obviously, this is part of his final effort to wake Kirito up. You can find more information on the circumstances in my What Happened to Kirito video, and I also partially hinted at his plan in the previous trailer explained video. If I say more, it will become quite the spoilers, though I'm sure light novel readers are either crying right now or yelling at Higa asking what the fuck he's even planning on doing as if the previous three he had available did Kirito any favors. I mean, if anything, this guy right here did more damage to Kirito than any of the villains combined. But we'll get back to his plan somewhere later in the video, though I'll not explicitly state that was his plan, you know, being vague and not wanting to spoil you too much and stuff, though It'll probably be clear anyways. Ugh, wh why am I even being vague when this screen already shows the plan clear as day? But goddamn, as Anima kicks in full blast again, visuals go full blast too. We see Leafa as Terraria being badass as fuck, along with Shinon being relatively badass. There are a couple of important things to mention here, so we'll get a little fragmented and not strictly follow the editing sequence as is. First. Let's start with Leafa stating she would never fall from wounds like this, and yes, she is indeed referring to the multiple swords stabbed on her back. There are two reasons she can survive despite absolutely eating shit. Well, three reasons. First one being that she is a fucking badass. Secondly, she is using a super account with maximum possible HP. It's not unlimited, but it's quite damn high, much like Shinon and Asuna. However, that does not mean she is invincible by itself. What makes her truly able to withstand the entire horror of the war is her super account ability that I hinted at in the previous scenes. Her saving curse in a sense, as the ability causes her much more pain than... It makes her task easier, let's put it that way. You can see the leaves flying around her and if you were perceptive, 
you would easily make the connection back to the scene with Lil Pilin and the flowers around. As the goddess of earth, Terraria is the giver of life and blessing and her ability is a passive ability that Leafa does not really control. Once her HP reaches a certain point, the ability procs creating an oasis-like garden around her filled with flowers spreading spatial resources which simply heals her, preventing her from dying her ultimate death. The catch is that, <laughs> considering the circumstances she finds herself in, death would have been the better choice, yet her will to carry on is what makes all of her scenes all the more special. And then we head over to another scene of war, with Shinon utilizing the knowledge she had received prior to give Incarnation a go and summoning her trusty Hecate into the battlefield. While her Hecate is not the only thing she summoned, albeit unaware, the person she is fighting, you have seen earlier, in his full tactical GGO gear, subtilizer on his drone, that thingy, yeah. You can clearly see we're rapidly moving into the incarnation reaching bullshit levels of power creep at this point, one of the reasons I prefer Human Realm Arc over War of Underworld. But this isn't even his final form. That's not all we see here though, I, I will not hint at his final form. With the war taking a turn for the worse, we see Renly going in to rescue Tize, who obviously will have more screen time together, although not in this anime adaptation run, as well as this scene with Siune of the Sleeping Knights and two players in red knight armor. Um, sorry, maybe this will get to some of you the wrong way, but I do not understand the people simply jumping on board the is this rain from the game worse train, you know? It isn't. The hairstyle is different, hair color is different, the hair clip instead of anything that resembles a maid style accessory, on top of the fact that only Japanese people in the battleground are the people on Asuna's side. Rain, aka Karatechi Nijika, is Japanese from mainland Japan. But anyways, going back to the scene itself, you can see more knights in the back and Siune is surrounded by them. Well, you see, Siune is Korean and based on the speech sounds coming from the other side, she realized they were going up against Koreans in this fight and had the hope to change their hearts and explain the situation in their own language, which she hoped would make them listen to her to a certain extent. This is exactly from that scene and what you're seeing here with the two players turning around to look towards someone approaching is only one of the many twists and surprises you will experience in this specific scene alone. Certainly one of the more tense moments of the war. We see the effects of the war on Lisbeth, though I'm glad they did not show some other people in the trailer that we will certainly get to see when the anime airs. As I said in the other videos, bringing young kids who have not even lived the uglier side of Aincrad, let's say, it does take its toll on them. Then we head over to Alice and well, this may be a significantly heavy spoiler as it's not gonna be subtle at all, so you may want to head over to the next timestamp, I'll give you 3 seconds to stop the video, 1, 2, 3. If you're still here, Alice asks will I be able to see my loved ones again and she's speaking to Shinon here, you have seen it in the previous trailer too. And by loved ones, she means the people she cares about of course, because Shinon told her to move south and log out from this world. These people include the likes of her father Gaspot Zuberg and the other Integrity Knights, but mainly her sister Selka. And of course, the next shot she is flying away on Amayori with Takiguri, Amayori's sibling, missing a third dragon that Berkuli got here with and you see someone disintegrating on the edge of the plateau. But the effort was certainly not in vain. But that leads us to the final scene. We see Pluro's sword starting to glow and if you look carefully next to Kirito you see a rugged boot next to him lying down on the ground. It is the ghost of the past who arrived looking for a rematch but is severely disappointed to find the empty husk of the black swordsman. And what follows? appears to be Higa's plan with the girls starting to shine, signifying that Higa has started the process. To be frank, this was quite misleading for me because these scenes could have easily been taken from the very end of the arc and I won't be surprised if they ended up using them here out of place, 
But still, I'll go with the sensible theory that they would not spoil the ending and make my statements based on the prior assumption. It is not only the three girls whose floodlights have been connected to Kirito to recreate his broken self-image. I say three girls because... <laughs> <laughs> A1 really put Alice here just to bamboozle you, she has absolutely nothing to do with any of these scenes, as you can see she doesn't even glow like the others, but also the fourth flaclight echo Higa had found in the unlikeliest places on an object with an underworld with the ID WLSS703 or DLSS703 depending on the translation you read, meaning double edged long sword ID number 703. And that is why before you see the girl start shining, the trailer makes sure it shows you the blue rose sword shining as the soul fragment of Yujo that resided inside the blue rose sword since their fusion as a part of the sword's memory reaches out his hand to Kirito to lift him up one more time. And we see the most gut-wrenching moment in this entire trailer with Kirito's hand being completely soaked in blood, his own blood with color completely gone from his hand as if he was dead with no more blood pumping in his veins, heeding Yujiro's call. I won't go into specifics as I would rather let you live the horror without a heads up. I'll say this much, Kirito would not have stood back up if it wasn't for Yujiro. There is so much I can say about this beautiful scene, this is the ending of an incredibly long sequence, but I will leave it for the episode explained once we get here in the anime. A lot of people asking about the hands, I thought it was very clear considering the exact scene this one followed. But the first hand after Yujiro is Asuna's, you can see the survivor school uniform sleeve there. The second one is Shino's hand with a plain black and stylish sleeve. And the final one is Sugua's with the sleeve of a red blazer along with a white long sleeve shirt inside. And of course, if that wasn't enough hints, on the final reflection of the blue rose sword we see Yujiro walking towards Kirito, which is of course symbolic there, not literally he's not walking, that's, that's the memory of Yujiro. Oh boy, this was longer than I expected. Since I talked about my opinions on anima in the previous explained, I'll say a couple words about the ending theme reveal, I will by Aoi Air. I was expecting a slower, more somber song as the ending, this one feels a bit more upbeat slash actiony. That's it, when I said a couple words, I, I literally meant a couple words, this is all I have. Endings are usually as good as how they are utilized at the end of episodes, so before seeing any of the episode's endings, I would like to keep an open mind to the song itself. I am thrilled by the level and detail of animation we have seen in this trailer, it is much much better animated than all the previous trailers, which gives me good indications that the delay was definitely well used, as I mentioned during the video, especially Berkuli fight comes to mind. But that is all I got. If you made it this far, hit that like button and subscribe and hit the bell icon as well and comment Prince of Hell down below to let me know. You'll understand that reference soon enough. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook for the fastest news possible and check out my Lens Squad merch. A huge thanks to all my patrons and channel members as always and until next time, stay cool.